but we're live online. How about that? So good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to McKee's Rocks Assembly of God. For those of you that are joining us online, we've just enjoyed a wonderful time of worship together. And uh, the, that it, there is a link to that on our website. Um, as with everything else that's going on around here, uh, we uh, have chosen to set aside the announcements uh, in lieu of referring folks to the website. So we encourage you to look there. It's McKeesRocksAssembly.org and um, everything that is going on, everything that we're doing, all the announcements, all of that is there for you. Excuse me. Singing with a mask on is... Uh, even harder on the throat than singing without a mask on. So, For three years, we focused on the word that the Lord gave us in 2017. Three years. And that word is, it's time to rebuild. We don't believe that season is over. In fact, we believe that season has just begun. The rebuilding that God wants us to do here to establish the church that he desires on this corner. He's privileged us to participate in that process. He's building his church. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we're believing God to build the church that he desires here, and he's going to do it through us. In January of this year, we introduced a new series entitled Preparing for the Post-Pandemic. We began where we must begin, with preparing our hearts by surrendering them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If Jesus isn't Lord of our lives, we're not going to accomplish anything for the kingdom of God. He has to rule and reign in our lives. And so that's the beginning of this preparing for the post-pandemic, is preparing our own hearts. We then talked about preparing our minds in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17, and the first part of verse 8, verse 18. Wrapping up our time together that week, looking at Philippians 4.8, concluding that we must dwell on these things. We've got to think on these things. We've got to dwell on the things that God has delineated there for us in the book of Philippians. I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind goes places it ought not to go. And I've got to rein it in. I've got to take those thoughts captive. I've got to yield again. It within me and in my mind and in my spirit, re-surrender to Christ on a regular basis. I don't know about you, but that's where I live. And we've got to think on these things. Keep our focus where it needs to be. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We then began to discuss preparing our practice. And we're talking about walking in a worthy manner. And we saw how such a walk includes living differently than those who don't know Jesus. If there's nothing different about us than the rest of the world, then why should anyone pay attention to what we have to say? I remember seeing a, uh, a quote from an, an unsaved man who said, people in the church want me to surrender to Jesus, but there's nothing different about them. There's, why should I do what, why should I follow them when they're wrestling with the exact same things I'm wrestling with, and they're not finding any victory over it. As we walk in Christ, and we walk in victory, and we have the assurance of the eternal life that He has promised us, there should be a difference in us. People should see something different about us. Then we went on to discuss the importance of effectively representing truth, being truthful people. Are we people that other people can trust to tell the truth. In love, respectfully, not looking to just crush people and blow them away. Sometimes we tell the truth in hurtful ways, but that's not the way we are to be representing the God that we serve. We need to be people of truth and telling the truth in love. We then talked about anger and the importance of letting it go. If we continue to cling to anger, it's a destructive thing, very destructive thing. And we then looked at the importance of leaving the past and whatever prevailing sin uh, we were engaged in before we came to Christ. Leaving that behind us. Turning away from it. Repenting. Repentance is not a, a, a term or a concept that is necessarily popular today. 
But it's critical. It's biblical. We've got to come to that place of repentance. Repentance means turning around and leaving behind the things that are behind us and pressing on toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. We've got to repent, leave those things behind us, and walk away from them and move forward into what God has for us. And then last week, we talked about watching our words, watching our mouth. <coughs> It's, I've, I've told you about my, uh, my friend that I met through my secular job, and <clears throat> he recited to me about my, uh, my no pain, no gain, and my illustration of it, and we talked about that, and you know, we've got to watch our mouth. God has given us the ability to control our lips. James says, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous little thing. It's a small, small flame that can set a whole world on fire. And uh, so we've got to watch our mouths. This morning, we continue our discussion, seeing that the primary focus and goal of it all is not grieving our God. Not grieving our God. May we be found honoring and glorifying our God, not grieving Him. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. One author states that this is very solemn and emphatic counsel. It's very serious stuff. We need to take this to heart. We need to keep in mind that this is, you know, it's important that we not grieve our God. And it's an emphatic counsel. It's strong. The, the, uh, Paul, when he writes this, is being very direct and very strong in what he's saying. We need to be found not grieving the Holy Spirit. Now keep in mind, Paul is, is writing to Christians. If you, if you haven't surrendered your life to Christ yet, what Paul is saying here only applies to you once you do so. But having surrendered our lives to Him, we should be found honoring and glorifying God, not grieving and shaming Him. Contrary to some contemporary opinions, our lives as Christians can be displeasing to God. There are those in the, in the church today that are convinced that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you live your life. You, you prayed the prayer. You got baptized in water. You accepted Christ as your Savior. And now you just go on ahead and live your life. And, it does, and God just overlooks it all. He winks at our sin. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Alive from the pit of hell. We are new creatures in Christ. Old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And uh, as such, it follows that there could be consequences for our displeasing or grieving God. We don't like to hear that. But there can be consequences if we refuse, not fail. You know, failure, God will cover failure all day long. Back to repentance. If we turn around, if we repent, we confess our sin. That's what 1 John tells us. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Failure's repairable. Refusal is dangerous. Refusal is dangerous. Yet our focus must not be on the fear of punishment. If you're kept where you are by fear of punishment, let me help you to know there's a better way. The potential for negative consequences is not what should motivate us. God is not looking for an opportunity to punish us. Can I tell you that again? God is not looking for us to mess up so He can punish us. That's not the God that we serve. I grew up with that kind of an image, and I've told this hundreds of times in my years of preaching where I, I had this image of God as dragging along this big stick with nails sticking out of it, just wait for me to mess up so he could whack me on the head. That's not the God w that we serve. Our God is a gracious and loving God. He's not looking for an opportunity to punish us. Proverbs 9, 10 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Yes, we need to fear God. There is reverential fear of the Lord is reasonable. 
It's recognition of who He is and our com- comparable insignificance. If, if we could just get that into our mind, how great He is and how really insignificant we are as individuals. The, you know, the, the great cathedrals of back in the day, these massive structures, the reason for that was to give people a sense of awe of who God was. I remember a number of years ago when I was, I was on an airplane, I was flying out of town for a conference, and I don't know what caused me to go there, but I was at the window seat, and I, I like the window seat in a plane. I think it's kind of cool to watch running down the, the runway, and all of a sudden you just kind of lift off the ground, and then, you, you know, as you're soaring through the air and you look down. But I remember it was night. It was nighttime. Really dark out there. See the little blinking wind uh, lights on the on the on the airplane. But as I looked out down over through the window to the ground, I was just struck. It just that's just from what thirty thousand feet maybe. And you can't see people from that distance. You could barely see buildings from that distance. And it just struck me how much less significant in comparison to God are we. We are so much smaller than He is. Yet He's mindful of us. The Scripture tells us that He has the hairs of our head numbered. Well, you know, that's, that's less of a challenge for him for me today than it was when I was younger. But God is mindful of us. Yet reverential fear for us of who he is is appropriate and reasonable if we just recognize the greatness of our God and our insignificance by comparison. Yet the knowledge of who he is causes us to understand that as we endeavor to serve Him, we need not tremble in expectation of judgment. If your focus, your goal, your hope, your desire is to be pleasing to the Lord, you don't need to fear failing. You don't need to fear His judgment. Psalm 103.14 says, "He, He Himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. He understands our weaknesses. He understands that we're flawed. He understands our failings. He understands the struggles that we go through. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the very throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Jesus came so that there is no question, there is no doubt that God fully understands what it means to be man because the God became man in the flesh and he dwelt among us and he lived this life and he walked this life yet sinlessly yet without sin. And He did it by the same power that is available to us today, the power of the Holy Spirit who will come and dwell in us and enable us to live a life pleasing to God. Rather than focusing on fear of punishment, because we've come to know Him, we desire to honor and please the One we love because He first loved us. We recognize what Jesus has done for us. We recognize the price that he's paid. We recognize how he has bridged the gap between us and a holy God and made it possible that we might love him because he loved us first. 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and through 19 says, By this love is perfected in us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. 
and his love, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts that we might love our fellow man and that we might love our God and look to honor him and to please him in all that we do. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Are you going through a tough time today? God's got a plan for the other side. Are you encountering difficulties today? God has a plan for the other side. We don't see it. We don't understand it. We don't know it. We can't comprehend it. And oftentimes when we're there, it's difficult to see beyond the here and now. It's difficult to see beyond the pain. But God has a plan. And the scripture tells us that he causes all things. Say all things. God causes all things to work together for good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. He's got a plan. He'll work it out. We might not see it now, but He's got a plan. He'll work it out. To grieve someone means to create mental anguish or emotional sorrow. The point is not that an individual, and in this case, according to the Scripture, we're talking about grieving God. It's not about the the fact that the individual is grieved or is experiencing grief. The focus here is being grieved, that we are afflicting, inflicting grief on our God. Have you ever inflicted grief on somebody? Or have you had grief inflicted on you when we you did nothing to receive it you did nothing to prompt it or to promote it yet that grief was inflicted on you and we sometimes grieve our God who has done nothing to deserve our grief we cause him pain this passage underscores an accurate understanding of the Holy Spirit because it says He refers to the Spirit of God here. And the the first thing that we need to recognize is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a mere power or influence. Because only a person can be grieved. And it speaks of grieving the Holy Spirit. He is a person. We need to recognize that. He's not an impersonal force. He's not the force being with us. He's the Spirit of God dwelling among us and dwelling in us. Secondly, He is God. And as stated specifically here by Paul, who refers to Him as the Holy Spirit of God. I remember when I was writing that book about being led by the Holy Spirit, the editor took exception to my use of that phrase. And, well, I backed up from it. He said, well, isn't isn't that redundant to say the Holy Spirit of God? Yet Paul uses that phrase. The Holy Spirit of God. He is God. And it's important that we recognize that the Holy Spirit is God. He's not just a magical, mystical force. He's a person. He is God himself. We believe in the orthodox view of Christianity that God de- that declares God is a trinity. And I, it, it blessed my heart to see the song this morning, you know, Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. We believe in the Trinity of God, the triune God. He's three persons existing eternally, manifest in in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, represented to us in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself declared this truth. In his instructions of baptism in Matthew 28, 19, he said, Go therefore. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, not in Jesus' name. Baptizing them, not in the name of Yahweh. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in his own declaration, he asserted the reality that the the, the triune God has ever been manifest and represented by these three persons. I'm reminded of the old hymn written in the 1800s which boldly and accurately declares, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The Spirit of God is God Himself. The Holy Spirit is God Himself. Thirdly, God the Holy Spirit, as His name declares, is holy. Holy. That that word holy is so misused. And so abused. He is holy. 
He's pure. He's completely other than from what fallen humanity is. He's holy. We may recognize that overt or obvious sin or immorality or cheating or lying or stealing or profanity or murder or other things defined in this context grieve Him. Because we recognize how opposite that is of what and who He is. Because He's holy. And when we act in unholy ways, we, rec- we may recognize that, co- that that causes Him grief. But do we recognize that our mere insistence on our own way, rather than yielding to His wise guidance, grieves Him. It grieves Him. May we be found yielded to Him because our refusal to be yielded to Him grieves Him. Charles Spurgeon, a highly regarded Baptist preacher of the 1800s, known as the Prince of Preachers. I, I read a little bit about him as I was looking to quote him this morning. And he, he didn't have a great deal of education, and he wasn't highly regarded in religious circles. But he, there were thousands of people that mourned him when he died. Thousands. Because of his effectiveness in communicating the gospel and the souls that he reached. He's quoted by one author as saying, I think I now see the Spirit of God grieving. When you are sitting down to read a novel and there is your Bible unread. Perhaps you take some book of travels and you forget that you have got a more precious book of travels in the Acts of the Apostles. And in the story of your blessed Lord and Master, you have no time for prayer, but the Spirit sees you very active about worldly things. And having many hours to spare for relaxation and amusement, yet you have no time for prayer. And then he is grieved because he sees that you love worldly things better than you love him. You know, we live in a day and an age where I'm just so busy is is a war cry. I'm, I'm just so busy. And there's truth to that. We are running in a gazillion directions all at one time sometimes. But if we're too busy to make time for the Lord, then we're too busy. And something else needs to go. We make time, listen, we make time for what is important to us. We make time. For what's important to us. It's been said that if you want to see what is really important to someone, look at their calendar and their checkbook. Look at where they spend their money and where they spend their time. Those things indicate what is important to us. And I would submit to you that those of you that are gathered here this morning are declaring that your time in the presence of God is important to you. But let's not limit it just to our Sunday mornings. Let's not just limit it to attendance here. There are those that tune into YouTube on a regular basis, week in and week out. I, I know that there are those that make this a priority. You're unable to be here in the building, but you're there. You're tuned in today. We make time for what's important. Our priorities are revealed by what we spend our time doing and where we spend our money obtaining. Spurgeon goes on to say, it is inexpressibly delightful. It is an inexpressibly delightful thought that he who rules heaven and earth and is the creator of all things and the infinite and ever blessed God condescends to enter into such infinite relationships with His people that His divine mind may be affected by their actions. What a marvel that deity should be said to grieve over the faults of being so utterly insignificant as we are. And the point that he's making is how much does God reveal His love and His concern and His care for us that the Word of God declares that He's grieved by our failures. Are we grieved by the failures of other people? Of the, of the struggles that others go through? 
Sometimes we are. Sometimes we think, well, that's their problem. God doesn't see us that way. And how much more magnificent and how much greater, how much beyond who we are is He. And He's mindful of us. He further points out that while all sin is displeasing to God, sin in His own people is grievous to God in the highest degree. My pastor used to say, or a pastor friend of mine, I should say, used to say, sinners sin. That's what they do. Sinners sin. People who don't know God behave like they don't know God. We can't expect people that don't know the Lord to live according to His ways. But His people should be expected to live according to His ways. And so God is more greatly injured by the the, the, the rebellion and the rejection of his people than he is by those who have not surrendered to him. While our sin as his people does not cause God to hate us, he does hate our sin and is greatly grieved by it. When we insist on carrying that thing around day in and day out, it grieves our God. When there was a, a preacher years ago who talked about scruffy, had scruffy in his pocket. You know, we have that, that favorite thing that we want to hang on to, that, that sin, that rebellion against God, that we just, it's hidden in our breast pocket. Nobody knows it's there, but it gets the kicking, and it gets the squirming, and it gets the making itself known, and next thing you know, it jumps out. Listen, God sees it, and he's grieved by it, and our place should be to surrender it to him to repent of it, to leave it behind us, and walk on not looking to grieve Him any longer. Spurgeon concludes that the Holy Spirit would not be the Spirit of truth if He could approve of that which is false in us. He would not be holy if He approved of unholiness continuing within His people. That which is false in us, He would not be pure if that which is that's what I get for going away from the quote. Let me go back to the quote. The Holy Spirit would not be the spirit of truth if he could approve of that which is false in us. He would not be pure if that which is impure in us did not grieve him. He would not be holy if that which is unholy in us, was the point I was making, did not grieve him. He's grieved by unholiness. He's grieved by our rebellion. There is nothing that grieves a parent more than watching a child make choices the parent knows are destructive. There are parents in this room, and I know every parent in this room has had a child that has made made choices that the parent cringed over. Maybe the parent even tried to prevent the child from making that mistake. But there comes a point in a child's life where the child makes its own choices and a wise parent recognizes that they must allow the the child to make that painful choice. But the parent is still grieved because they see the pain that the child is headed for. They see the destruction that lies ahead. Of course, earthly parents worry about the potential outcome. We, you know, if you've been on the planet long enough to have a child and that child is growing and you see and them making the mistakes, you, you recognize there's danger down the road. <coughs> you know what is the potential outcome of their behavior. And you worry as an earthly parent about what might take place if they continue down that road. So how does this apply to God? Is he worried about our failure? No, he's grieved by it. Of course, God is not human and he's not worried about our future in the sense of not knowing what it will be because he knows the end from the beginning. God knows the outcome of our lives. He sees what we will become ultimately. In Isaiah 46 Verses 9 through 10, it says, I am God and there is no other. 
I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning. God knows the end from the beginning. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow are all the same to our God. He sees it all, all at the same time. He's the God of, 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 of eternity. The beginning and the end, He sees it all. He's not worried about what will happen, but He is grieved by our behavior, recognizing the destructiveness that will come about in our lives. And here in Ephesians 4.30, we have an example of Scripture ascribing human feelings to God so that we might better understand. We can't fully comprehend who God is. So Scripture often ascribes human experience and human emotion to Him. There are actually theological terms for such things. And, but God is greater than we are. We're made in His image. But he understands, he recognizes. This expressing of God being grieved speaks of his nature, his care, his compassion, his desire for the best for his children. Every parent wants better for their kids than they had. Every parent. I don't know a parent alive today that wants their kids to go through difficulties like they've gone through. In fact, I think sometimes today, parents go over the top, and they spare their children some pain that the children might benefit from. I'm just saying. As Pastor David Guzik points out, the Holy Spirit's grief is not of a petty, oversensitive nature. He's grieved with us mainly for our own sake. God's not grieved because He's God and we're not. God's grieved because He sees the destructive potential for our behavior. He's grieved with us mainly for our sakes, for He knows what misery sin will cost us. He reads our sorrows and our sins. He grieves over us because He sees how much chastisement we incur and how much communion with Him and with His people that we lose because of our disobedience to Him and our rejection of His ways. God sees the pain that will endure, and He desires to spare us unnecessary pain. Our passage this morning tells us the Holy Spirit is the one by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. We were sealed for the day of redemption by the Spirit of God. A seal indicates ownership. In ancient times, they would they would pour out a a gob of wax, hot wax on a document, and they would seal it with a signet ring. And that would indicate that the, who the owner of that document was, who was the one that sealed that document, that it should not be opened unless it was under that owner's authority. So too, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We have been given the Holy Spirit as the assurance of whose we are. We belong to Him. Jesus said He will be with you, and He is with you, and He will be in you. God desires to pour forth of His Spirit in His fullness, that we might experience Him in powerful and overwhelming ways and transforming ways in our lives. He is the seal of ownership. God's ownership of us, the Spirit of God who convicts us from within, who draws us closer to Him, desire, or stirs up a greater desire, a greater longing for a greater level of holiness and a greater service to God, a greater obedience to Him. Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit of God at work in us reveals and stirs in us a recognition that we are His children, that we are His sons and daughters. Romans 8.23 says, We ourselves have the first fruits of the Spirit. The Spirit of God transforms us. He works in us and He brings about change in us. It's not about cleaning yourself up so that you might be pleasing to God. It's about surrendering to God so that He might clean you up and make you more pleasing to Himself. 
working from within, not external efforts at fulfilling religious requirements. It's internal surrender to a holy God who then brings about that transformational process and conforms us into the image of His Son. A seal, however, is also an assurance, like a down payment, that what has been promised will be fulfilled. When you go and buy that new car and you sign that document that says, I'm going to pay all this money, and you pay some money down, that gives the lender an assurance that you're going to pay for that car. The Holy Spirit is God's down payment in us, that He will fulfill that which He has promised, that which He has declared. We are sealed for the day of redemption. Romans 3 Verse 23, the second part says, We groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The day of redemption is coming. Yes, we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Our spirits have been redeemed and renewed, but our bodies, oh, I don't know about you, but my body is failing. Age is taking its toll. These bodies are are failing. We are in decline physically, and we're aging. It's part of the process. Oh, but friends, the day of redemption is coming where a new heaven and new earth will come about, and we'll get our new resurrected, glorified bodies. The day of redemption is coming, and the Spirit of God is that seal of assurance that we are being prepared for that day. We have been redeemed from a sin debt that has been paid. Our eternity is assured. I believe in eternal security as long as we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. I don't believe that our our salvation is willy-nilly, wishy-washy, save this moment and lost the next. No, no, no. God's Grace is greater. Jesus' blood is stronger than my own failings and my own weaknesses and my shortcomings. His, he is able to keep us until the end. And the seal of the Spirit of God on our lives assures us that as we continue to cooperate with Him, He will continue to work with us and in us and through us, and we are assured of that eternal life with Him. Yet our full redemption, as manifest in these bodies, will come on that day of redemption. Therefore, let us not grieve the one who has sealed us by refusing his work in our lives. Let us be found as a people of God who are saying, yes, Lord, not I don't think so. Let's not hang on to those scruffies in our pockets and insist on having our own ways. Let's not hold back on what from what God wants to do in our lives. I remember a long time ago, there was a a radio station that actually God used to reach me and to draw me to himself. And there was a, uh, I I can't remember the name of the program that was on, uh, but there was a, 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 a comedy group that did a skit and they talked about allow not allowing God into a room of their life. Keeping God out of a room in their life. Is there a room in your life that you're keeping God out of? Is there an area of your life that you're saying, I've got this God, you don't need to come in here? Do you have a door locked that you're not allowing Him to have the key to today? May I submit to you that you're grieving your God. That you're grieving the Holy One. We must allow Him full access to who we are. We must sing that song with conviction, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. Are we surrendering all? Are we giving our all to Him? Or are we holding back and grieving Him in the process? Do you know the Lord today? Is Jesus Savior and Lord of your life today? If he's not, that could be corrected in this very moment. If you're on the YouTube or Facebook channel, it's a matter of simply calling out to God, recognizing that you're separated from him and that you need a Savior to bridge that gap. And that Savior is Jesus, the one we're going to celebrate in just a few weeks as resurrected from the grave. 
He's the only one who has risen from the grave, never to die again. I had this conversation with someone just this past week. Never to die again. Jesus rose from the grave, never to die again. He's the Savior. And if you will but surrender your life to Him, just invite Him into your heart. Say, Jesus, come, take control of my life. I surrender to you. Invite Him in today. And He'll make Himself known to you. Do you know the Lord today? Have you been sealed for eternal life by the Holy Spirit? Do you know Him today yet you recognize this morning that you've been grieving Him by your attitudes, your actions, or your priorities in life? This is the opportunity. This is the moment to repent of that thing that is between you and the God that you declare your love for this morning. Do you know the Lord, yet your attitudes and actions and priorities have caused distance in your relationship with Him and those around you, and you desire to have those things corrected today? With every head bowed and every eye closed, no one looking around. If that's your circumstance this morning, if you would say, Pastor, I know I've been hanging on to this area of my life. I've been this lock, the door has been locked and dead bolted and I'm not allowed God to meddle there. But I'm opening that door this morning. I'm opening the lock and I'm asking you to pray with me that I would have the grace and the strength to allow God to deal with me in this area of my life. If that's you, slip your hand up. I want to pray with you this morning. Or maybe you're here today and you recognize how this has caused a a separation, a, a hindrance in your relationship between the Lord and you or other believers or other family members or friends or people that you love and you desire that to be mended. If you want to slip your hand up, I'll just pray with you right where you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we're grateful for the seal that you placed on us. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit who is at work in us, convicting us concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, helping us, oh God, to to leave behind the things that are behind us and pressing on toward the mark of the high calling of God that is in Christ Jesus. Father, be with these today who are calling out to you for the very first time or, or are calling out to you from a place of having held back an area of their lives or recognizing that their disobedience or their rejection of your way has caused pain and separation. Father, bring healing to relationships today. But most of all, God, I pray that we would be found no longer grieving you, but rather honoring you. Father, I pray that we would be found a blessing to you, not a grief to you, a joy, O God, to you by our attitudes, actions, and behaviors. Father, I know you joy over us because we're your children. But you joy even more when we're found obedient and yielded to you. Have your way in our lives, O God, as we look to be prepared for this post-pandemic by walking in a manner worthy of you. Use us, Lord, in this community for the glory of your name for the salvation of souls, for the the restoration of broken relationships, God. And we thank you, Father, for our time together this morning. I pray that you would be with us as we leave this place. Help us to go out and, and represent you well in our workplaces, in our families, in our communities, wherever we may go. May your name be declared by the power of your Spirit working through us. And we'll thank you and praise and honor you as you do these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Look forward to seeing you for Bible study Wednesday night at 630. And we'll be on Zoom in just a moment.